If you're thinking about the 2007 MLB season, you're likely thinking about the magical story of Rocktober. Six and a half games out of a playoff spot with 13 games to go, the Colorado Rockies rattled off a miraculous win streak and won a dramatic tiebreaker game against the Padres to secure the final playoff spot in the National League, eventually winning the pennant. The funny thing is, despite being the hottest team, the Rockies didn't win their division that year. The team who did was the team they beat to get to the World Series, the Arizona Diamondbacks. Arizona had the same amount of wins that year, but edged out the Rockies by winning their head-to-head, but in their NLCS matchup, they got absolutely smoked in a four-game sweep. When you look up and down this roster, though, it's not shocking to see why. The 2007 Diamondbacks had a clear-cut ace, but no star bats, a perfectly average bullpen and rotation, and didn't really do anything particularly well. But, somehow, they were the top seed in the National League. To put it simply, they were an average team that managed to punch way above their weight due to a little bit of luck. How'd they do it? They were coming off a disappointing last-place finish in 2006, reeling from the departure of a franchise face in Luis Gonzalez. He went to the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Diamondbacks no longer had a star hitter. They certainly had a star ace, though, in Brandon Webb, who won the 2006 National League Cy Young. Webb's peak was incredibly elite, albeit brief, and if you want a deeper dive into that, I have a whole video on his peculiar career. Regardless of that, though, Webb led the charge in the 2007 season with a campaign arguably better than his 2006 season, including 236 innings and 34 starts in this season alone. Not only did their roster look very different between seasons, so did the uniforms. 2007 was the first year where the Diamondbacks formally departed from their iconic purple and teal uniforms that they won the 2001 World Series with. They instead opted for their new primary red uniforms, which have been cycled in and out throughout the years. One thing this 2007 team had going for them were the people in charge. They were led by Bob Melvin, who reached the playoffs for the first time this season and would do so seven more times with both the A's and the Padres in the future. The director of the farm was future World Series winning manager A.J. Hinch as well. But okay, am I just calling them lucky because of a lackluster roster and good manager? No, there are some stats to back this up. A good team statistic that evaluates how a team should perform is the Pythagorean winning percentage. The algorithm measures an estimate of a team's record based on their runs scored and runs allowed. It is by no means perfect like run differential as a whole because blowout games can skew this value both ways. And for the 2007 Snakes, they had four losses by double-digit runs, which likely sunk their run differential. But we shouldn't discount it entirely. Entirely. A Pythagorean win-loss record can certainly be a signifier for a team over or underperforming. The 2007 Diamondbacks won 90 games in reality, but their Pythagorean win-loss record was 79-83. and 83. An 11-win swing would have taken them from first place to fourth place. And a huge reason why they overachieved was winning in clutch games. They had an astounding 32-20 and 20 record in one-run games. And we'll dive into the importance of this in just a little bit. But let's further break down this roster and see how they won with the players they had. In terms of the offense, the Diamondbacks didn't have a single hitter with an OPS plus 10% better than league average. Their lineup had decent balance with six hitters registering a value of 100 or greater, but no one in this lineup truly stood out. Chris Young clubbed 32 home runs and stole 27 bases in an impressive rookie year, but his OPS plus was just 88 thanks to some poor on-base numbers, and he also struck out plenty at a 22.6% clip. Their two best hitters in terms of wins above replacement were Orlando Hudson and Eric Burns. The former was a defensive whiz who clubbed 10 home runs and stole 10 bases while batting a shade under 300. The latter smacked 21 home runs to go along with an unbelievable 50 stolen bases, doubling his total from the year prior, which was then a career high. Rookie Mark Reynolds served as another premier power hitter of the team and unsurprisingly had the highest OPS numbers of anyone in the everyday lineup. His 17 home runs pale in comparison to the crooked numbers he put just a few seasons down the line, but it was still very much needed in a light hit hitting Arizona lineup. This season also saw the call-up and debut of the former number one overall pick from the 2005 MLB draft, Justin Upton, who was only 19 freaking years old. Think about what you were doing when you were 19. Not doing homework? Smoking pot in the cul-de-sac? Drinking fireball? Maybe you're not even 19 yet, but I bet you weren't manning right field for an MLB team, and that's pretty cool. They probably called him up a little bit sooner than they should have, and he wouldn't have much success in his rookie year off the bench, but in the ensuing five seasons, he'd become one of the best players in Diamondbacks history before they traded him. Future reliable backstop Miguel Montero also served as the backup catcher for this 2007 team. But overall, the squad ranked as one of the most mediocre offenses in baseball. They ranked in the bottom 10 for strikeout rate, runs scored, and OPS, and ranked 
bottom two for batting average, on-base percentage, and weighted runs created plus. In every major offensive category, the Diamondbacks ranked alongside teams that finished last in their divisions, and yet they were the top seed in the National League. So this must mean that their pitching staff carried all the weight, right? Well, no, that didn't happen either. Brandon Webb did his part by finishing runner-up for the Cy Young that year, but everyone else on the roster basically just treaded water or drowned in said water. The team brought back Randy Johnson in a trade with the Yankees to form a dynamic duo at the top of the rotation for a feel-good story. Johnson, however, lasted just 10 starts before requiring season-ending surgery. Outside of those two, Levon Hernandez, Doug Davis, and Micah Owings ate decent innings, but none of them excelled in their starting roles. The last of that trio, Owings, was a weirdly good hitter, though. He went 20 for 60 with four home runs and seven doubles, so in an average lineup when he was starting, he was likely the fifth or sixth best hitter in that lineup. What a dog. But yeah, their rotation fared well in ERA rankings thanks to Brandon Webb, but was mostly middle of the pack in terms of strikeout to walk rate, whip, and hard hit numbers. Bullpen had some sneaky good arms, most notably Jose Valverde coming off a disastrous season where he lost his closer role. In this season, he led MLB in saves with 47 and made the all-star team in a return to form. Supplemented by middle relievers like Tony Pena, Brandon Lyon, and Juan Cruz, all of whom had an ERA plus of 150 or better in their career best years, the Arizona bullpen might have been the best area of their roster and this was one of the biggest concerns going into this season. They ranked in the upper half of MLB for ERA, whip, and walk to punch out rate, but again, we're not tops of the league in any of these categories. So yeah, these Arizona Diamondbacks were perfectly average for the most part, but despite the holes in their roster and the injuries they endured, the Diamondbacks pieced together a 90-win season and the best record in the entire National League. They never finished a month with a record below 500, but my, oh my, were these guys streaky as hell. Buckle up for this schedule roller coaster. Okay, they started with a six-game win streak to jump out to a 7-2 and two start. Then they had five losses in a row, then six wins in a row, then another five losses in a row to turn the calendar from April to May. Orlando Hudson hit at a 352 clip in the first month, and Jose Valverde racked up a league-leading 10 saves in April. Then, eight consecutive wins to close out May with a record 10 games over 500. Filling in for a slumping Chad Tracy, rookie Mark Reynolds smacked 24 hits in his first 15 games with 11 extra base hits in May. But then, another slump. The Snakes went 14-13 and 13 in June with a run differential of negative 19, including a sweep at the hands of the Yankees. They followed that up with seven losses in eight games to open July, just four games over 500. They lost Randy Johnson for the season and fell all the way down to a 47-43 and 43 record, third place in the NL West and not sniffing a playoff spot. But then, almost miraculously, they rattle off 10 wins in 11 games to close out July and go back to 10 games over 500, despite a 13-13 and 13 record and a negative 13 run differential in July. Also, the front office didn't make any trades to help out this roster, so the odds were really against them. Despite slumping to close out the season, losing five of their last seven games in September, a Brewers win over the Padres secured the National League West crown for the Snakes, and sent Colorado and Arizona to that fateful Game 163 for the wildcard spot that we all remember. So yeah, despite a trio of really lengthy losing streaks, the winning streaks were able to counteract that. And like I said before, the key for this team was winning the close ones. Their 32 and 20 record in one run games was much much better than their division rival in the Padres who fell out of the playoffs in the final game of the season. They went 23 and 26 in such games by comparison. To put this into scope, even if the Snakes just went 500 in these games, which would have been a 26 and 26 record, this would have eliminated them from the playoffs entirely. This was truly the reason they made it as far as they did. And hey, maybe they were just a clutch team, and clutch teams usually do well in the postseason. And at the beginning, they sure did. Despite being the top seed in the National League, many baseball fans did not see Arizona as a serious threat to make some noise in October, especially with the red-hot Rockies and all four American League playoff teams holding a better record than the 91 Diamondbacks. But they got off to a hot start, taking down the Cubs in Game 1 thanks to seven brilliant innings from Ace Brandon Webb and solo home runs from Steven Drew and Mark Reynolds. The Cubs would, however, grab an early 2-0 lead in the second game of the series thanks to a Giovanni Soto blast. But this Chris Young three-run shot gave Arizona a lead they wouldn't relinquish. The Snakes battled around Ted Lilly and Doug Davis in the bullpen did enough to grab a 2-0 series lead. Chris Young hit his second home run in the series, and Levon Hernandez shoved for six innings. Eric Burns and Steven Drew added bombs of their own, and Jose Valverde locked down a solid ninth inning to secure a 5-1 win and a 3-0 series sweep in the NLDS. Not only did the Snakes advance, they did so in dominating fashion, trailing for just a single half inning in the entire series. And then, Rocktober struck. The Diamondbacks ran into an absolute buzzsaw in the flame 
burning hot Colorado Rockies, and this team ultimately became the reason why no one really remembers the 2007 Diamondbacks. Brandon Webb got outdueled by Jeff Francis in Game 1, then Jose Valverde melted down in a brutal extra inning loss in Game 2. Josh Fogg allowed just one earned run and was backed by a Yorvit Toriaba three-run home run in Game 3, and a Matt Holiday Grand Slam in Game 4 capped a six-run inning that would ultimately seal a series sweep. If all that seemed like it happened in a flash, that's because it did. But for the moment, the future seemed incredibly bright in Arizona, and the front office rightfully decided to buy in and try and compete again in 2008. They traded for Dan Heron, signed Adam Dunn, got Randy Johnson back for a full season, called up Max Scherzer, and watched Justin Upton blossom. By all accounts, their roster for the next year improved by a huge amount, and it showed with a franchise-best 20-8 and start to next season, but this is sadly where the run of magic and success came to a screeching halt. A myriad of injuries derailed a promising start to the season with various lengthy losing streaks, and their 82-80 and record by season's end was only good for a second-place finish. They would tumble back down to the cellar in the following two seasons, putting their magic 2007 season deep in the rearview mirror. This season remains the farthest the Diamondbacks have advanced into the postseason aside from their 2001 World Series run. So what should we make of this season? It's a statistical anomaly highlighted by the performance of one elite ace and the contributions of several solid role players. Winning in a clutch game shouldn't be counted for nothing, but in terms of a team overachieving to the highest degree, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better example than these snakes. No one had them reaching the LCS that year, let alone winning the division or holding the best record in the National League. And it's part of the reason why baseball is such a beautiful sport. It lends itself to magic stories because of the insane variability and endless gauntlet of regular season games. Any team can get hot, capture lightning in a bottle, and ride it out to tell an amazing story. And with more playoff teams than ever, I think we might be due for more of these stories in the coming years as well. But still, none of these future teams will compare, in my mind, to the lunacy that is the 2007 Diamondbacks. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. That'll be all for now, though, and I'll see you guys next time.